Hey, it's great to be here today. It's always great to be anywhere near Book Expo. I have a long life with the book business. I uh, was first a bookseller. I created the first chain of book superstores. It was called Bookstop and Bookstar, based in Austin, Texas, where I live, and stretched from um, uh, California to Florida. And uh, Barnes & Noble bought it. 1989, and it was their entry into the big box bookstore business, and then I was an author, and then I was a publisher, started a company to make business reference books. It morphed into a company called Hoovers.com, if you've ever looked at that, and that's my name, and, and, uh, um, and then, uh, but above all else, I'm a reader and a book collector. I live in a library. I had to buy an old Catholic school to hold 55,000 books that I live with, and the way I phrase it is if you stacked them up, they'd be twice as tall as the tallest building in America. So I'm into books, old school media, and I'm into, and I teach entrepreneurship now, and I blog, and I put most of my energy into YouTube these days, um, but one of the things that I've come to realize, I got interested in business as a little kid. I grew up in the General Motors factory town, Anderson, Indiana, and nobody, people were talking about how did presidents think, and how did kings and queens and generals and leaders think, and their strategies and decision-making styles. And I thought that was all real cool, but I'd ask, well, what about General Motors? It seems like a big deal here. 27,000 people work there in a town of 60,000 people. And they're like, uh, well, what about General Motors? They make Chevrolet and Pontiac and Buick. And I said, no, no, I mean, tell me about who started it and who runs it. Nobody could answer my questions. I'm in a newsstand, a little kid, and, and discovered Fortune magazine, the Fortune 500, the 500 biggest companies. And I went to run, and my parents said, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. You've you got to get me a subscription to this. And I'm like, oh, you weird kid. You know, why don't you go play basketball like a normal Indiana kid? Anyway, got my subscription. Two months later, I entered the seventh grade, and, and I uh, have been looking. The new Fortune 500 came out a couple weeks ago. It was the 50th year that I've grabbed that and gone down through all 500 companies. So I've really watched businesses evolve and studied the history. And what I find is that our overall knowledge in our society of how we got to where we're at today, which is the only way you can see the future, that we're really weak on understanding history and how we got to where we're at today. And even when we do study like business and enterprise history, we tend to study Edison and Ford, who I have studied, and amazing people. But those are really technologists and hardware technologists and, um, and really manufacturing leaders, whereas as we go, the world economy now is 70% services, and we need to understand the great service innovators. If we're going to build better hospitals and better universities, which are the things we really need going forward, we need to study the people that built great restaurants and hotel chains and cruise lines and services and media companies. And the other thing is we tend to obsess on the greats who were technologists, who, were, who invented gadgets, and yet the people who've really changed our life the most, uh, most I believe, are more cultural entrepreneurs, the people who, who have invented new kinds of media. So if you pull up uh, uh, my computer and pull the slide up, that's uh, who I am. That's uh, where you can find me. I'm easy to find. And I have, oh, guys, uh, several hundred business cards. I'll be glad to hand out, hand out later, but I'm easy to find. Email me with your questions and thoughts. So what I'm going to do today is, as quickly as I can, tell the story of the two people who I think were most important in the making of the media age. And we'll learn about who Harry and Bill were. First guy I'm going to talk about, I call him Magazine Man. And, and to understand this man, who is Harry, uh, you first need to have a little histori uh, historical context. So I start out around the turn of the previous century, around 1900, the dominant figure in the U.S. magazine industry was this guy, Cyrus H.K. Curtis. Philadelphia. He had bought, made a little magazine about for farmers and everything, and his wife wrote a column for women, and that was real popular, so he said, well, let's sell off the farm magazine. Let's focus. Let's make a women's magazine. He called it the Ladies' Journal. It was like 1880s, but he had that image in the middle of a home, and all the readers called it Ladies' Home Journals. He said, okay, okay, guess you're right. <laughs> I'm wrong. It's a Ladies' Home Journal. He found this guy, a recent immigrant from Holland, uh, a young man in his 20s at that point, to become the editor of the Ladies' Home Journal. And, and there was a lot of controversy about, well, uh, how can a guy, a guy edit this ladies' magazine? And, but they used that to their advantage. They made a big deal about, well, this is really different. And actually, Bach was real advanced in terms of talking about uh, birth control and women's rights and women's suffrage and very advanced. And, and, and any time an advertiser would go to Curtis, the owner of the company, and say, oh, we're not going to advertise because that crazy Bach is going off the edge, deep end. Curtis would say, well, that's your problem. <laughs> you know, we don't have to take your head. 
Mr. Bach is the editor. If, you, if you've studied great bell towers, Caroline in Central Florida, the biggest one in the United States, it's the Bach Tower from the money he made. Well, the Ladies Home Journal became an important part of American uh, life, and as of uh, last year, it was still the 12th biggest circulation magazine in the United States, so it's still going. Uh, opportunity came along to buy this old magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, for like a thousand dollars. Everybody thought it'd go broke. Curtis bought it, found an editor uh, for it, and turned it into the most important magazine in America. There was his editor, George Horace Lorimer, and, and it had a personality. It was for conservative American businessmen, men, not women, and they got home at, uh, on Thursday night, and there was their Saturday evening post that arrived on Thursday. I never quite got that. And, and um, this is an institution. It and a magazine called the Literary Digest were the two most important magazines in the United States. It should come in 1910, 1920 had millions of subscribers. So here's an industry where you have a giant company, and there were other companies too, Hearst and everybody was in there, but Curtis was the guy and the company. And along come these two Yaleys, Harry Luce and Britton Haddon. And, and uh, they were very different from each other. Harry Luce was a poor kid of a, uh, a Presbyterian missionary to China. And Harry Luce, all through his life, kind of suffered under wishing he'd grown up in the United States and became a, almost a super patriot. But he, he didn't grow up in the United States. And missionaries don't really have any money, but the rich McCormick family from Chicago gave scholarships so young Harry could go to Yale. Britain came from more, more money over this side, but he didn't really have a lot of money. And, and they really were out struggling for money. And they were like real people. You know, here's Britain Haddon and his friends at Coney Island. You know, a fake picture of being in an airplane, the hottest hottest new concept, the uh, iPod of its era, whatever. And, um, and, and so these two guys, and, and Luce's full name was Henry Robinson Luce, but everybody who knew him called him Harry. And these two guys said, look, we're looking around, and what we see is the Saturday Evening Post dominates, and it's what most of America reads, but it's a slow read. It's these long stories. People are in a hurry. And I said, look, more and more people are going to college. That's kind of a new idea. And they're getting out of college. We've got more college graduates. And we need to come up with a way that they could digest everything that happened that was important in the world in an hour and read some magazine and grab it all in an hour. And they're working on this concept. They're out trying to raise money. Um, they, they rented a, a house. Um, a uh, uh, part of a house on East 17th Street in New York City. I just took this picture two days ago. Nobody, there's no historical marker on it, but in on the second floor of that building, they paid $55 a month for it. They worked on their idea, and, and they tried to raise $100,000. They went to all their Yale friends thinking, oh, all these rich kids, 100 grand will be easy, 10 of them, 10 grand apiece. No way. All the rich young men going to Yale were, were, had their money, some of them already, but they were trying to impress their fathers that they were serious. And so there was no way they were going to invest in a college buddy's business idea, you know? And so, but one of them, Harkness, his mom put in 20 grand. They'd raised 66 grand. She took them up to 86, and that was enough for them to say, oh, great, we'll go. And they'd already quit their jobs, like several weeks earlier, for Baltimore newspaper. Because these guys were really journalists. They'd been at the Yale paper. Uh, Luce was an award-winning poet at... So these were really wordsmiths, and, and that got them to a $100,000 goal. And I don't know, we don't know if Mrs. Harkness held her stock or not. She was the biggest stockholder when they founded this. If she had over the next 40 years, it would have become worth $23 million and paid $6.6 .6 in dividends. So it turned out to be okay. Trying to come up with a name for this magazine, there were ads for a big tire company, Time to Retire, Fist Tires. And these were all over the United States. I think they had a big one on Times Square, too. And, and Harry Luce saw you know, to read time, time. And so out they came, February 27th, 1923, the first issue of Time. And the idea was it was going to be weekly, you're going to be able to read it in an hour. It had 22 basic departments. So it wasn't just politics, it wasn't just war. It was going to have architecture, it was going to have art, it was going to have music, it was going to have travel. It had a separate Latin American section. These guys were way ahead on the coming, the seeing of Latin America all through the history of their company. And out it came. It didn't make its first year goals, but it was rising in circulation and went 18,000 readers and then 50,000 and 70,000 and enough that they raised more money. Here's uh, uh, Haddon and, and Luce, uh, 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 where it's being printed in Cleveland, Ohio at this time. Uh, they moved to another location that I went and checked on. These 40th Street, they actually were in about six locations in about a year and a half. Because they're going from two people to three people to four people to six people. There's the Print and Crafts building. It faces uh, Madison Square Gardens and, and uh, Penn Station. Uh, they even did a stint at the beautiful Chrysler building. 
Needless to say, Time became incredibly successful, and it's still, it was the 11th biggest magazine in the United States last year. Now, she's kind of fallen on hard times, all things considered, but still, number 11, not too shabby, but, you know, Steve Jobs was on the cover a lot, many times. Here was their, I think, their first Facebook cover. Zuckerberg was on again more recently. Uh, the guy, apparently, from what I can find out, was on there the most was Richard Nixon, um, 55 times, and he was on there in good times and in sad times, you know. Um, things change. Um, and, and six days to the day after they went to press, Britain had and he got a strep infection, went to his heart, and he died. I think he was 31 years old. And so here was, and there's two books that have been written about his life, probably the most unknown major hero in, in media. Nevertheless, Loose, really shaken up, lost his partner, although they were always at odds. A lot of these pairs, man, they, they had conflicts and they had different personalities. Loose was very serious. They used to talk about how he went around like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. It was very hard to get him to smile. And even some of the people that worked with him and loved working with him really didn't like him as a person. He wasn't very approachable. He was kind of gruff. He didn't care about clothes or style. He'd wear one brown shoe and one black shoe. Um, but, but he and his buddies bought out the Haddon Airs, and his company's only six years old. They bought him out for like a million dollars, and it gave loose control of the thing, and then he became the man. And, and, but he was an idea guy. He had all these ideas. Maybe do a sports magazine. Maybe do a magazine about people. Maybe do a magazine about architecture. Idea day. And he created an experimental department. And even though they weren't making much money yet, he had one of his key editors and a researcher uh, assistant go into a little office and close them off and not tell anybody in the company what they were doing. And said, hey, I got this idea for a magazine. I want you to work up an idea. And, and what the test was, was he said, I'm thinking about a business magazine. But tell business in a whole new way. And when business leaders are smart, and good, cherish them and celebrate them. When they do stupid things, embarrass them and be brave and make it really a bold. And, and he found out it was easier to take poets and turn them into business journalists than to take accountants and turn them into journalists. And so he hired, he actually had a bunch of like Marxist almost and stuff working on this deal as it evolved. But what it was, a test, and with the experimental department said, I'm going to give you a tough challenge. Try to do a story on it and it and International Telephone and Telegraph Company, was like the at and of overseas. They controlled the Spanish telephone system and a lot of cables and systems, and they made the equipment, the switchboards and all that jazz. And, but the guys who owned it, the Ben Brothers, B-E-H-N, when, when, when Time Inc. contacted us and we wanted to do a story about you, they said they refused to talk to him, refused to give him any biographical information. I don't think they gave him pictures or anything. So the test was, can you write up this company and make it a good, fascinating, compelling story? And these experimental department people did. And it was later published in the magazine. That's from my collection of my library um, in the, in the mid-30s. What they came out with, once they said, look, we can do this and we can change the world, Fortune magazine, February 1930, a dollar a copy, ten dollars a year. So outrageously expensive. And, but the sucker was a work of art. And, and I just love looking at the old magazines because you get a feeling for the time. Here, and this is a, a, like November 1930 issue, later that same first year. And I have the Empire State Building. It's going to open May of 1931. Look, she's under construction. Or the Boulder Dam Project, going to power the West. It was before Congress very controversially renamed it Hoover Dam. It's called the Boulder Dam. And here, the big beautiful hotel in Havana for all you New York party animals go down. It's going to open December 1930. So you capture, but here's what's cool, because Lou said, I want it to be beautiful, and I need the best photographer so I can find. And he found the work of this young woman in the Midwest named Margaret Burke White. And she had been doing factory jobs, like the factory say, go take pictures of our steel mill. But she did them so artistically, and somehow Lou got them, and he said, ah, we got to get her. And this was in that November 36 fortune. It's amazing. It's a picture of her, and it tells about she went to Germany to take pictures of the factories. Of course, this is pre-World War II. She got arrested. They thought she was a spy. It took her showing her portfolio and having New York wire in and the State Department get involved and everything to get her out of jail for this photo series about German industry for Fortune magazine. And so there's a picture of her, and it's talking about her, tr her trials and tribulations in Germany, but in very fine print, which you probably can't read, at the corner it says Berenice Abbott. Berenice Abbott was one of the greatest photographers ever. And if you could check out the photography museums and the photography history of New York, 
you know, she's another famous one. Well, here it was her taking a picture of the other photographer. So I thought it was so cool. And there's old Margaret Burke White in front of one of her favorite industrial objects. And there's the kind of thing she went to do to get these great shots. And there's an example of one of her great shots. Uh, these are just a couple of other of the famous Margaret Burke White pictures. A great one in the Depression, the people on the bread line in front of a billboard bragging about how great and fortunate we are to live in America. This wonderful photograph. He brought artists in, the great artist Charles Sheeler, the precisionist. He did this cover for Fortune. He did photography, but he also did paintings, almost like photorealism. That's the biggest factory in the world, the uh, uh, River Rouge plant of Henry Ford. Had 100,000 workers in one factory, Dearborn, Michigan. And, and there's a, the a aviation. And now these are just some of the Fortune covers of their first few years, just to give you some idea of the emphasis on art and beauty and, in a broad sense, content that Henry Luce had in mind, because he was personally running these things even as he added more and more employees. He was the driving imagination behind the organization. And, the, and, and I collect old magazines. You can't find old Forbes. You can't find old Business Weeks. They were all thrown away. You can find these. Go check out ABE Books. They aren't cheap anymore. I have almost a complete collection. Uh, um, just amazing, and the diversity, the variety, and how it changed as you went through the 30s and 40s and 50s. And, and, and kept up with the times. And then here, by July of 55, you barely read it, at the bottom it says the 500 biggest corporations. Well, one of their editors said, let's do a list of the biggest companies. And it's the Fortune 500. By the next year, they understood enough, oh, make that a big deal, put it on the cover. And, and over the years, those became famous covers. And here they lit up uh, their building. Pretty sure it's their building, yeah. Uh, lit up with the, all the office lights turned on to do the 500. By the World's Fair in Chicago, 33, 34, big exhibition for time and fortune. And then Lou says, you know, pictures. Pictures are powerful. We know some great photographers. We've got them here at Fortune. Let's create a magazine that um, shows the world through pictures. And so this is the original prospectus uh, for, they called it the show book of the world. And it was going to be uh, uh, about pictures and full of pictures and a picture of the week and a story of the week, and, but a whole new approach to it. It's like a 20-page document. If you want to see it, i got a copy of my briefcase. If you, if you dig hard, you can find it on the web, a PDF you can download. Four photographers, Ivor, Al, Al, Albert, Albert, Alfred, Eisenstadt, <laughs> Eisenstadt, Margaret Burke White, and two other famous photographers. They became the life staff, and the cover of the first Life magazine, November 36, is Margaret Burke White's photograph of the Fort Peck Dam out in the West. And, and then, okay, so Life, <clears throat> the most successful magazine in history had, the most a magazine had ever achieved was like a half million readers within its first year. Henry thought that, uh, Harry or Henry, he thought maybe we'll have 150,000. He believed in the magazine, but, um, and, and actually some of his editorial staff really nudged him to do it, and his, and his wife, who had had the idea when she had been over at um, Vanity Fair magazine. And, and so he thought he'd get 150,000. They opened the thing up, and they hit a million immediately. They could not find enough paper to print it. It was on ration at newsstands the first two years. It went a million, million five, million six. Well, it was the most successful magazine in American history, and it almost bankrupted Time Incorporated because he had sold all the ad rates out, out at the low assumption, and he'd given them a one-year guarantee. If you advertise with us, I'll hold the page rate for a year. Well, you're trying to print 1.6 million magazines. You're only taking ad revenue in like you're doing 200,000, and they, and they made like a couple million off Time Magazine. They lost almost all of it back on life. They were losing 50,000 a month at one point, and most people would have dropped it. He didn't. He believed in it. He kept plugging away. He says, well, we just got to go to 2 million subscribers. So then a break, maybe. Who knows? Somebody once said to Luce, well, you've been very lucky. He said, I was about as much luck involved with this as, as planning where a tank goes when it drives through Russia or whatever, you know? I mean, he said, no, it's about ambition. It's not about luck. And what happened? There was a, a movie made, a medical movie called The Birth of a Baby. And, and, and it showed a baby being born, and that, man, that's obscene. That's not legal in this country. And it was banned in New York City. And Luce heard about it and said, can we get stills and run them in the magazine? And all his people said, well, you know, we're, they're going to close us down, the authorities, if we run that. And he says, damn right, you know. And so they ran, these are the actual photos, Life magazine, April 1938, and they had these pictures in a 17 million Americans looked at that magazine, uh, and they were arrested. Uh, 33 cities sued him. It was yanked off all the newsstands in the Bronx. Luce made sure he went to a detective and personally sold him a copy of that April 38 issue. 
okay, so that he would be cited personally for selling obscenity. And, and that's what popped Life magazine up to like 2 million, 2 million plus subscribers and blew it through the roof and made it a financial success. Of course, famous for its covers as it went on through time. I remember my older brother took me to see Goldfinger, James Bond when it came out. Still a great flick, 64. A competitor, look, a couple of guys from Iowa, Minnesota, the Coles brothers, they, they and came up with, look, a cheaper paper, but kind of like life, about the same time. And they were actually friends of Luce's and showed it to him, and he and time invested like 25 grand in it. A year later, they all realized, well, maybe competitors shouldn't own part of each other. And, and they, they bought him out. He made a profit, though, but he had invested in his own competition. By now, the company's getting big enough, even if his life is rising, get their own building, the first time in life building, 9 Rockefeller Plaza, over there in Rockefeller Center. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the best I can to show. There's a blue line, the one is higher on the left. That's Curtis Publishing's annual ad revenue. And what happened is in 1942, the red line, Time Incorporated, passed them up. And then it was a slow, they were kind of neck and neck until about 1950, at which point Time took off. Later, Curtis basically disappeared. It was bought out by some people from Indianapolis. They still have the Saturday Evening Post name and a website. But Curtis collapsed later. And of course, Time, you know, Time Warner, evolution. But, you know, he's a big deal, became famous, married this uh, beautiful uh, woman, his uh, second wife, Claire Booth Luce. She was later a uh, Republican congresswoman from uh, Connecticut and a power in the Republican Party. She was ambassador to, to uh, Italy, and they were a big deal, a couple. And um, while he's still running at 54, they come up with Sports Illustrated, not very successful, a really bad start. Got into swimsuits later got more into swimsuits, or maybe less into swimsuits, even later. Um, in 59, what I would call the monument to this man and his company, the first building in the new western section of Rockefeller Center, the Time and Life building. Now, when he said it, he said, look, this building is about work. This is about effort. And, this is, and he was, you know, a functional, a cerebral, um, one kind of guy. Although there was art around there. And in fact, that flooring, that's from the Copacabana Beach because they were on the Avenue of the Americas. I know New Yorkers call it Sixth Avenue, but, you know, legally it's Avenue of the Americas to celebrate the unification of the Americas, another Latin thing. The only time he made it on the cover of Time was after he died. Um, died in the late 60s. He had been retired for a couple of years. Uh, and, and it was within five, five or six, something like that, years after his death, uh, we could figure it out, 74. Yeah, uh, so maybe seven years after he died, People came out, and that is their greatest magazine today. It's the 10th uh, best-selling magazine in America. Time is 11th, and Sports Illustrated is 14th in the 2011 list. So that's my first star. The second guy that I think changed everything for all of us uh, is in broadcasting. Now, again, a little historical context. Radio. Radio was a huge deal. You, there have been book after many, 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 many books written about radio. There, the guy that invented FM radio, he killed himself because he couldn't get the powers that be to accept his new technology. There, it's just, and there's documentaries, PBS shows. I'm not going to give you the history of radio. If there's one guy you need to know about, it was Marconi, Italian guy, ended up his mom. He was a teenager, and he, he tested all this stuff in the backyard and whatever, and came up with radio, and, 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 he, and he traveled all over the world. His mom took him to England and all this, and he created the British Marconi Company, which owned most of the patents. But there is a lot going on, but the certainly key player in that context, the rise of radio, John Wanamaker, the great Philadelphia department store operator, he had opened stores in New York. This is this big building. Uh, it's not a Wanamaker department store anymore. It was still there. Um, and, and he was a showman. In fact, his big Philadelphia store still has the biggest functioning pipe organ on earth. They play it twice a week. It's now called a Macy's, like everything else, um, but in downtown Philadelphia. Well, here in New York, he had a pipe organ in there, too, but he also had a radio telegraph receiving station just to get published just to get buzz, because back then retailing, which is really my field I love the most, they were great showmen and they wanted to create buzz, you know, and knew how to do it. And, and so he put in a telegraph office, a radio telegraphy, wireless office, and, and one of the young guys, young immigrant, Eastern European kid, David Sarnoff, uh, he was a young, he taught, learned radio, and he was up there in the Wanamaker building receiving signals. 1912, when word gets out that the sh famous ship, the Titanic, has gone down. And Sarnoff was one of the first people to receive the radio broadcast that, hey, it's Titanic sinking, and nobody can believe it. And he ran down the street and handed out the news, and, and, and he, he went into radio. In that context, 
So Mark, British Marconi owned patents, also General Electric, AT&T, Westinghouse in the United States had radio patents. Most radio work was for uh, shipped ashore, and most of it was for the U.S. Navy. And the government was real worried about, well, this can become a big industry, allowing ships to talk to shore, and we can't let it be controlled by foreigners, even if they're Brits, you know. And so Owen D. Young, the president of General Electric, got with the U.S. government and AT&T and Westinghouse and United Fruit Company, which actually also was in the radio business to communicate with their empire in Central America. And they, in 1919, created Radio Corporation of America. And this thing was fundamentally designed to be the national monopoly. It was backed by the government. They forced the Brits to sell their Marconi patents to this operation operation in the U.S., um, it was a, they all ganged up and said, no, we're going to, and so this company was intended to rule with, with no competition. And the young guy who went to work there and was general manager and later president and later CEO was David Sarnoff. Now he said, look, ship to shore is cool, I got that. He said, but I think if we put on this radio thing and we just blast it out to the open ether, people are going to listen to it. And maybe we can put like music or symphonies and then people all over can buy a little receiver and they can listen and all his bosses said you're nuts go back to your desk you're nuts well when he became president of RCA and he had the power in 1926 he, he said no we're gonna do this we're gonna create broadcasting created the national broadcasting company there he is speaking RCA wholly owned NBC NBC was a division so RCA made radios made equipment mastered the technology and in some ways, a little parallel to Apple in that they're a hardware and a software company, if you want to think about it that way. Now, NBC was so powerful that they had two networks, the red network and the blue network. The government said, oh, even that's going too far. They made them spin off the weak sister network, and that was spun off to become the American Broadcasting Company. So that was just an orphan, a side child of NBC. RCA bought Victor Records, got in the record business, got in the movie business. This RKO means radio, Keith Orpheum. Keith Orpheum was the biggest vaudeville chain in America. They own theaters, combine them with R. And that's, you know, Citizen Kane came out of that. Sarnoff made the cover of Time more than once because RCA led in the introduction of color TV around 1960. And his monument, the biggest one I'm going to show you tonight, is the RCA building, which they now call the GE building. But don't you believe it? It's the RCA building. Old timer like me, and uh, it's still there. I took that picture two days ago. Uh, one of the greatest pieces of slab architecture in American history, but it really is a, just a stunning building. And and really, when they built Rockefeller Center, and the Rockefellers were looking for tenants, Nelson Rockefeller was the first leasing agent. They were out, uh, and and they got the RCA to take a bunch of it, made the RCA building the tallest one in their headquarters. But the whole thing was in a sense Radio City. It's almost like, you know, Disney World, where this is Radio City. And, of course, they built the music hall there, the biggest movie theater in the United States, and still is. If you haven't seen it, you should go see it. It's just a wonderful thing. And nearby the NBC studios in the same complex, in the RCA building. Okay, so that's your environment. Big, giant company backed by the government. RCA, uh, GE, AT&T, and Westinghouse, and United Fruit owned it. Oh, uh, no way you could touch them. A couple Jewish guys, uh, uh, Jake and Sam Levy, uh, from Chicago, went to Philadelphia, Congress Cigar Company, their name was Paley, P-A-L-E-Y, their cigar was La Polina, sold it for $30 million right before the Depression, sold it to a cigar company. It was, I think, number one in the U.S. Sometimes it's hard to pin down the data, but it certainly was a big player. They sold it, and Sam Paley's little boy, William Samuel Paley, who was like 26 years old then, 27 years old, um, Bill, well, Bill, um, Uncle and dad, well, Bill learned the cigar company. He grew up rolling cigars and all that, really learned business there in the cigar business. And dad and uncle were off on a trip, and Bill went down to the local radio station in Philadelphia, WCAU, and placed ads on that radio station and a little fledgling network they were involved in called the Columbia Phonograph Broadcasting Company. A little struggling thing, losing money, uh, you know, distant, distant, distant second to NBC. And he ran ads on it, had a weekly show with a singer, and, and, and when, when especially Uncle Jake got back, he just hit the ceiling and said, what are you doing, kid? Nobody's going to listen to this radio nonsense, and, and made him stop the ads. And then Dad and Uncle were out walking on the streets, and all these people come up to him saying, what became of the radio show? That was great. And they said, look, we were spending a million a year on print advertising. We never got as much feedback of that silly little radio show. So not only did they go back on radio, but when the kid, Bill Paley, said, I want to buy CBS, they said, okay. 
And he had inherited a million dollars out of the $30 million deal. He took 400000 of his own money and 100000 of his dad's money and bought 50.3% of that little Columbia Phonograph Broadcasting Company for 503000 And And Columbia Phonograph Broadcasting, it, it had gotten the name from Columbia Records because they cut a deal where they could use their music and they'd put their name on the network. Uh, other than that, it wasn't related to Columbia Records, which was an older company. Um, radio, big hit, took off. You know, beautiful devices. Haley, with his little struggling distant second network, he's on a ship, he's crossing, he's going over to, uh, to the Atlantic, to, I guess you call it Europe, and, 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 and he hears a record, and it's um, Bing Cosby. And he, he, I guess radio telegraphs, whatever, back to shore and says to his guys, hire this Bing Crosby. Get him and get him now. And he goes on his trip, he comes back in three weeks, gets back, and he says, did you get Cros Crosby? They said, no, no, we checked into it. He's like a low life and a drunk, and he doesn't show up on time, and no, no, we, we don't want that guy. And Paley hit the ceiling, I guess, like Uncle Jake, and, and they hired Bing Crosby. That was a, one of the early big breaks to begin to build the network. He also, one of Paley's great insights is he understood the power of news. And he thought that if he, because all the money and all the power was on NBC's side, if he had higher quality, if he had better entertainment, and if he had better news, so Edward R. Murrow he hired, and he went and he covered Europe, and he broadcast live from London while it was being bombed and changed everything. Our entertainers, Arthur Godfrey, they moved, um, uh, oh, this is great. So they put, they, they were in Philly, and they moved it up to New York, and they went into the Paramount building, which is right on Times Square, still there. It's the Hard Rock Cafe, it's the old Paramount Theater part of it. And a lot of people think the movie industry is headquartered in Hollywood. I gave a talk on the history of the movie industry. No, no, most of the big companies were based in New York, and, they, and Hollywood took orders from New York. The industry was founded here, Astoria, Queens, and all that, and Edison, and Jersey. Well, Adolf Zukor, uh, that's the Paramount building. It's just a great building. It can get lost in Times Square, but it's, um, it's just the coolest looking old building. And in that building, Mr. Zucor, who founded Paramount, who really created the modern movie industry, he really, if anybody invented the feature film, it was him. Uh, I, I, I get to, the whole story of him, and he's, he's worth an hour himself. His office was up there. He's in his 50s. He is, he is a powerful man. And he, and he sends a message a few floors away down to Paley with his little struggling CBS network and says, I'd like to invest in your company. Because Zucor, he lived to be 103, and that man was always looking at the future and always understanding the future. And he said, I want to dabble in this radio thing. And, and he also had an interest in TV later. He went down and sent a messenger down, because, you know, Zucor is too important to go see Paley himself. Uh, well, offer you $4 million for half interest. Word comes back up, Paley says $5 million. And Zucor says, well, nice. Sends a messenger back down $4.2 million or whatever, $4.3 million. Word comes back, no, Mr. Paley said only $5 million. And Zucor said, oh, man, fucked up kid. What's wrong with this guy? And, and, and so he said, well, I'll meet with him. So Zucor meets with Paley and says, well, kid, son, you know, we're, we're paramount. And, 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 and Paley said, no, it's $5 million. And, and, and left. And, you know, the next day, Zucor comes down or his guy comes down and says, okay, $5 million, but you've got to take stock and not cash. We'll give you Paramount stock, $5 million worth. Paley says, okay, but if you promise to buy it back in a couple of years at a higher price, if we perform, if we hit $2 million in profits that year. And Zucor knew that the Paramount was just going to go through the roof, so he had no sweat, said fine. Well, between then and when the deal came due, the depression hit and Paramount stock collapsed. And Zucor could not afford to buy back the stock under the deal. So he and Paley rejiggered the whole deal, and Paley ended up buying out pay, uh, Zucor's interest at a real low price in a deal that was tremendously beneficial to CBS and its stockholders, mainly the Paley family. Anyway, then they moved. They finally got not their own building, but for 30 years, to really their greatest years in a lot of ways, 1929-59, they were in this building, 485 Madison Avenue. And it was in this building that Orson Welles, uh, uh, the night before Halloween in 1938, his Mercury Theater, did the War of the Worlds broadcast, which, you know, shook up everybody. Led to all kinds of lawsuits. They only paid off one of them. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, everybody was suing them for all the... F they all got freaked out. You know, you've got to listen to that broadcast. It's amazing. Um, and, okay, so Jack Benny, big guy on radio over at NBC, and, and Paley said, I want to get him. And he was wor working with his agent, who was Lou Wasserman, the guy who created MCA. It became MCA Universal. And, 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 and Benny said, 
Uh, well, they said, CBS said, look, I don't care what NBC's paying you. We'll pay you a lot more. And Benny said, no, the income tax rate is over 70%, incremental tax on uh, uh, high-income earners. And Benny said, so I won't see If you pay me $5 million a year, I won't see any of it anyway. Why bother? So what they did is they studied the tax experts and said, create a company that owns the Benny Show. We'll buy the company, and that way your gain will be taxed at a capital gains rate, and you'll make a lot more money. And Benny said, okay, I think they bought his show for like $2.2 million. The other thing, too, though, is that Sarnoff at NBC was trying to keep him at the same time Paley was trying to get him, but Sarnoff never met with Jack Benny because to Sarnoff, who was a technologist, and, and the science, uh, Benny was just an entertainer. There will always be plenty of entertainers, big deal. To Paley, entertainers were the world. They were what made his network great. So not only did he get Jack Benny, announced in November of 48, he got all the other big stars of the time. Most of them followed Benny over to CBS, called the Great Raids of 1948. And that put CBS in the leading position in radio just before the arrival of television, which had been demonstrated by RCA at the World's Fair in New York, 1939-40. What all those people are staring at is that image, you know, of like two blocks away there on the World's Fair grounds, pylon and tri per uh, perisphere, trilon and perisphere, uh, um, and of course TVs, beautiful, wonderful TVs. Nothing like youth. That's the kind that my brother and sister and I used to pull each other's hair out trying to get to the dial. I obviously lost all those battles. Um, and, uh, and even here's your iPod, uh, living room sized iPod, uh, home entertainment center. Um, ah, this chart doesn't do a great job, but this years across the bottom, 1921 to 1960, red line is how many American households had radio. But actually, if you look at it, there it looks like the slow curve. But if you look at it, I'm pretty sure the adoption of radio from 1920 to 1930 looks very, very similar to the adoption of the internet in American households over the last, uh, since the early 90s. But TV came up much faster than radio. And it hit, it hit New York City first, 47, 48, 49. And then it shot up and was in most American households by 1960 or so. Uh, NBC's still the dominant guy. RCA owns NBC, introduces color around 1960. But Paley was in there too. Now what's interesting is they were true networks. You know, it wasn't going through the air. It was running down cables between cities. So this is actually a map of the NBC TV network because it went, the signal went city to city and CBS and ABC, which had, I want to say a third of America or more could not even get ABC. It was the weak sister. CBS and they had Jack Benny, Ed Sullivan, Red Skelton, Jackie Gleason, but the big one, Lucille uh, Ball, Red-headed comedian, she, she had done some comedies where she's a crazy housewife and she gets, dreams up schemes and she gets her husband involved and messes up his life. And she wanted to do a movie or TV series, but she demanded that her husband, Desi, be in the series because she'd been on the road traveling. She wanted to have a family. She knew that if her husband wasn't traveling with her, it wouldn't lead to good things. And, and she demanded we, she do the show. Everybody wanted Lucille Ball. Nobody wanted Desi Arnaz. And even Paley himself said, look, A, the, he's a Cuban band leader. A, the guy's not even an actor. B, he has this thick Spanish accent. No American household is going to welcome him into their home. This ain't going to work. And Paley throughout his life had an incredibly good sense of what the audience wanted to see. And he knew they didn't want to see Desi Arnaz. Well, Lucille Ball stuck her ground. And she won, and I love Lucy. You can make a case. It's the most significant television show in history. And top, it was a top five show its entire life. Um, it, it, when, when they had their baby on the show, I think it was 1953, little Ricky, their second child, actually, and, and they did. I mean, she, she was pregnant in the show, and then the baby's born. That was the highest rated show of its time, and a lot of media analysts think that was the day that television became the core of American life, the day that little Ricky was born on TV. And they went on to leather great hits. We could do a whole program just on their hits. There was one of their greatest ones. This show was incredibly dominant at its peak. They had a big television studio out in L.A., um, but they kept their mind on news. Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, the whole CBS News things during its glory days. Nah, this is an odd chart, too. I guess they all are. What this is is of the top ten TV shows, which network had how many? And the red line that's on top on the far left and top on the far right, that's NBC. So they spent, and this is from 1950 to 1990. So for 40 years, NBC was way down here. ABC, the green line, was uh, zero. A lot of years had none of the top ten. Three times CBS had nine of the top ten shows. Two times it had eight. Over and over again it had seven and six and five. Most of the time, in this way of measuring, it was more important than the other two put together. 
And, and the thing is, especially in the 60s and 70s, those were good days for television. And all this, there's a lot of ways you can measure it. But um, uh, television, what this is, is the number one show, uh, series. How, what share of all American households watch that show? And when they started in the early 50s, it was as high as 60, 65%. That's back with I Love Lucy. By the 19, late 60s, mid 60s, it had drifted to where the biggest show of all got about 30% of American TV households watching it. It stayed at that level until the mid 80s. And then it began to trail off. I just showed here through 2004, it's down to like 17% then. But you know, network TV continues to decline. But it, but it held steady there for 20 years, and those were the same 20 years that CBS was going nuts. Um, and uh, this is, the blue line is revenue for time incorporated, growing, growing, growing. The light green one is CBS. They were about the same size company throughout the 40s, but when television hit, CBS took off. They redefined how they report their revenue, so there's a second curve, but it was taken off too. So that's how television, and, and in profits, the red line is CBS. By 1958, they were making almost $25 million a year. Both of these were incredibly profitable businesses. If you look at return on assets or any real measure of how efficient. They built an empire. They bought the old Columbia Records that they were named after. Of course, the CBSI, one of the greatest logos and corporate design programs in American history. Paley made the cover of Time. He, a little different from Lucy, he had one buddy, a uh, right-hand guy who was with him his whole life or most of his career, a very complex relationship. When Paley retired, he didn't replace, pick him to replace him. You can read all kinds of books about whether that destroyed the guy or whether he was fine with it. Very complex, but um, interesting pair. Uh, Stanton was a psychologist, and he really analyzed the numbers and the advertising ratings and all that, and he even made the cover time. And then uh, um, another beautiful wife, Babe Cushing Paley, one of the three Cushing sisters, daughters of a prominent brain surgeon in New York, Harvey Cushing, all of them married wealth and Roosevelt family and Astors, and the youngest daughter, Babe, who was a famous a fashion icon. I mean, women's wear daily and everything thought she was the ultimate, kind of like what Jackie Kennedy was. At the same, and, the, and unlike Luz, Paley loved to party, he loved to eat, he loved to hang out with stars and celebrities, he loved to travel the world. And in fact, Truman Capote said, somebody said, boy, he's got a big smile on his face. Paley's got a big smile on his face. And his friend Truman Capote said, yes, he looks like a man who has just eaten another man whole. You know, and um, both these guys are very complex guys. Okay, so they got to go build their monument, and they do. Uh, they hire Eero Saarinen, the great uh, uh, Finnish architect. Actually, his dad had moved here from Finland when they came in second in the competition to build the Tribune Tower in Chicago, the Chicago Tribune, the McCormick family, and this giant competition of architects around the world. And when the Finnish guy came in second, he said, holy Moses, they like my architecture more in America than they do in Finland. Let's move there. And his son, Eero, and, and here he did the St. Louis Arch. He did the beautiful TWA terminal at JFK Airport, still one of the most remarkable buildings. Um, and CBS hired him to design their headquarters out of black granite. They went to huge efforts to find the right granite in Quebec, and, and 1965 opened it. By then, Saarinen had died, and Paley and Stanton almost hired another architect to finish it, but then they said, look, this is going to be the only skyscraper designed by the great era of Saarinen. Let's leave it. And it is indeed a beautiful building, only two blocks from the Time Life building. And the other thing I'll say about Paley as he left the Paley Center for Media a, f a few blocks over there near Rockefeller Center and go in there. It's open like three days a week and they have 66 viewing terminals where you can call up any of 150,000 television shows from the history of TV including PBS shows and competitor shows and everything. I dropped in there to talk to him about Paley. I couldn't get out of there. They had so much cool footage. But if you want to watch old I Love Lucy's or anything, it's just amazing. And that's from his money. And also in the honor of his father, he gave Paley Park, which is one of New York City's great quiet, private, meditative spaces in the heart of Midtown. They did that many years ago. The last thing I'm going to say about these guys is um, don't forget the advertisers. It's so easy to, to study these guys and learn from them, and they would have been nothing without Ivory Soap. That was the first real brand created by Procter & Gamble, who through at least most of my life, P&G, has been the biggest American advertiser. 
and, and ivory is what really started it all. Now, Parker and Gallon was founded in 1837. It's stronger today than it's ever been in its history. It's a company, if you want to study history, it's one, a great one to learn from. The big food companies, Nabisco, one of the greats, with still my favorite brand of all time, one of my favorites, You Need a Biscuit. I can't believe they dropped that name. Such a great name. Uh, maybe the greatest brand creator in history. At one point, this company created more millionaires than any other company in the world because of all their bottlers around the world. Um, we hate cigarettes, but they sure contributed to the growth of media, you know, uh, television and, uh, and print. Um, and, and cars, and this is Model T, but Chevrolet, and then these, uh, these are just some of the greatest car ads ever. Packard, at their positioning line, ask the man who owns one. Buick's line, when better automobiles are built, Buick will build them. And then really this, if you study the history of advertising, most people consider this the first ad that was about emotion, not just the product. Because the Jordan Motor Car Company, which was owned by a Jordan who was a marketing guy from another auto company, and it's um, somewhere west of Laramie, there's a bronco-busting, steer-roping girl who knows what I'm talking about. She can tell what a sassy pony that's a cross between grease lightning and the place where it hits can do with 1,100 pounds of steel in action when he's going high, wide, and handsome. Anyway, I mean, because people didn't make car ads like that, and after this, everybody makes ads in a sense like that, with more emotion. So let me recap a little bit what we can learn from these guys. And I, I learn every day from them. And the more I learn about them, the more I learn from them. Henry Luce, what was he all about? You read all the books, and there's several books about each of these people. If you email me, I'll send you a reading list and everything. Um, he was really a cerebral guy. He was really a thinker. He was a serious hard work, and I think his building shows that. It's really a functional building. It's really not that beautiful. On the other hand, Bill Paley was a man of art and imagination. Of, of, they talked about how visceral he was, but he was also a man of business. He loved to sell, and he loved to have business meetings. And yet, when I say this, it's clear Luce was an extraordinary businessman, and when you look at those fortune covers, those Margaret Burke White photographs, he was a man of art. And there's no question that Bill Paley must have done some thinking. And one of the things you see over and over when you read these stories about him is that, is that they're just full of curiosity. They drove everybody around them nuts with the questions they asked. Uh, which I believe is the essence of entrepreneurship. So when I put it together, I try to do a little triangle, and here's my best shot. Um, hopefully I'll learn and grow and maybe simplify it. But one of the things that they all had uh, was uh, uh, the lower right-hand corner, the thought, the study, the curiosity. No question, these guys did their homework. They didn't just go out and do it, they really researched, they thought about it, they tested their ideas, they talked to their friends. The other thing, they were both about content, and they knew that content would trump technology. That technology doesn't matter unless it somehow makes people's lives better. And, and they were obsessed with it over in the lower left corner. But the thing that I see, I advise, uh, I've probably seen five to 10,000 business plans, and I have 210 ideas for new businesses here in my pocket tablet. So I look at startups all the time. What often is missing is people don't really love the business side. They don't really love the transaction side. And, and these guys did. And these guys understood, and they understood the P&L. And, and the one thing I'd lay on top of all that is that what you find in both of these fellas, ambition, and when I say that, I mean it in the best sense. What I mean is they had incredibly high goals. They, they were reaching for the stars from the beginning. Neither one of these people wanted to start something small or build. They knew they'd start small. And the persistence, the losses they went through, the hard times, the failures, the time they couldn't take a pay increase, they had to take a pay cut. And, and, and then, of course, the passion for what they were doing. And I think if you look at all that, that brings me not to the end, but to the beginning. Because the foundation that's been laid not only by Luce and Paley, but by Goldenson at ABC, who I didn't even get around to mentioning, and by, and by all the other people in all the different forms of media and the people from Hollywood, that's really the beginning of the new media era that we're in and moving into and will be over the next 50 or 100 years. And I think that means I'm at least done. So that covers my uh, talk.